uh, now that we've looked at essentially uh, the uh, Prussian road to capitalism in the U.S. South, we're going to move um, in time. Well, I guess it's in time and also um, place and look at a very different road to capitalism. And we're going to look at the example of South Africa. Um, and South Africa, what's interesting is that in, in this particular case, we're really looking at the state uh, as the prime mover of this transition to capitalism. Um, so to better explain this, um, this uh, transition is, uh, I'm here with Professor Rick Halpern, and he's going to talk about uh, more in depth that transition. I'll ask him a few questions. He's going to basically what we'll do is we'll contextualize a little bit of European settlement, look at these sort of um, revolutions in South Africa that you what industries emerge, particularly in the mining industry. And then we'll look at how the state rationalizes the economy as it moves into the 20th century and you end up eventually with a apartheid state that most of us are at least partially familiar with in the South African case. Um, I think what we'll start with maybe is if you could just contextualize the initial European settlement of uh, the southern tip of Africa. Yeah, certainly. Thanks, Will. Um, I know that in History A09, uh, you've looked at the state and imperial expansion in the first third of the course. And I know that you've also looked at the importance of long distance trade uh, for the development of, of capitalism. And settlement, European settlement on the southern tip of Africa um, comes right out of those joint stock companies uh, that we've looked at uh, in this course. In this case, uh, it's the Dutch and something called the Dutch East India Company. Now, the main colony uh, was not in Africa. Uh, it was in the Far East, what's now Indonesia. Um, the colony of Batavia uh, provided the kinds of uh, spices and um, exotic cloth that uh, you've looked at when we've looked at um, overland trade uh, to Asia. Um, the settlement at Cape Town, or what becomes Cape Town, uh, was really a minor part of this far-flung Dutch trading empire. It was a resupply and layover port uh, for ships uh, that were heading uh, much farther east. Yet a colony uh, did develop, run very, very strictly uh, by the Dutch East India Company, which almost was a state unto itself. But in terms of economic activity, this is not a major uh, player either in the Dutch uh, uh, world of trade and certainly not in, in early capitalism. The British come into play at the very end of the 18th century um, and they come into conflict uh, with the Dutch. For Rick, um, for giving that sort of background into the settlement of uh, South Africa, particularly um, starting with the Dutch and then the British, but you mentioned at the end um, that initially that the British and the Dutch didn't have a lot of contact, but then eventually there was this conflict that emerges uh, between them. Um, is that conflict relevant to um, the transition to capitalism? And could you say a little bit more about that? Thanks. It's a really good question. And I think it is uh, highly relevant both to um, the story that's unfolding uh, about capitalist revolution in uh, Southern Africa, um, but also in terms of history A09. Um, I know that last week uh, in this course, um, you looked at the persistence of unfree labor and you spent some time talking about the various systems that replace slavery um, around the world, but particularly within uh, the British mm -hmm. Empire. Well, in Southern Africa, where the British and the Dutch settlers come into conflict uh, is over Dutch labor relations. Uh, the Dutch began to use native peoples um, as slaves, um, as clients, um, as very um, underpaid um, laborers. And as humanitarianism within the British Empire began to ramp up and there began to be quite a bit of anti-slavery agitation back in, in London, mm. British authorities at the Cape began to interfere with um, the more harsh and exploitative aspects of Dutch labor relations. And um, there's a point at which things become so tense between the two groups of settlers uh, that the Dutch, now identifying themselves as Boers and speaking a, a completely uh, different language, uh, Afrikaans, um, decide to pick up and retreat uh, into the interior, 
to be able to continue their uh, pastoral agriculture, their cattle raising, uh, their subsistence farming uh, out of the way of um, interfering British authorities. What you see here um, are the two Boer republics that result from this trek known as the Great Trek uh, into the uh, interior. Um, this occurs in uh, the later part of the 1830s. And although this map is from 1885, you clearly see uh, the Orange Free State right there in the center. Um, and right above it, you see the second Boer Republic uh, known as the South African uh, Republic. And I think it's fair to say that Boers and Britons um, pursue very independent uh, existences uh, after the trek. And the Cape Colony for Britain um, remains a minor colony, just as it was very minor for, uh, for the Dutch in the age of, um, of the primacy of their empire. But all of this begins to change at the, towards the end of the 19th century um, when there is the discovery of gold in the area around current day Johannesburg. Uh, that's the circle up above. Yep. And diamonds uh, in uh, the area between um, the Orange Free State and, and uh, Greek land west, the town of Kimberley. Um, thanks for that. So that just contextualizes this conflict that emerges between uh, the British settlers and particularly the British imperial state and its meddling in these kind of Dutch um, labor laws. But how does the, uh, the emergence of the mining industry, particularly in gold and diamonds, what, what is the significance of that in its transition to this capitalist economy that starts to emerge in the 20th century? If you could speak a bit more on that. Certainly, yeah. And again, it's, it's a very good question. So uh, Southern Africa, which had been um, at best uh, a minor concern of the expanding British Empire uh, with the discovery of gold in particular, but also diamonds, uh, Southern Africa blooms very, very large in the imperial imaginary, but also very, very large in terms of the world capitalist economy. This gold discovery quickly is understood as um, the most important discovery uh, of gold ever, uh, far dwarfing, say, um, the 1849 discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill in California, or the Yukon gold rush uh, that, that follows. Um, but there's real challenges for uh, British mining companies that want to get this gold out of the ground and turn it into gold bullion. It's interesting in this case, because I am familiar a little bit more with the California gold rush, having studied it. And um, I mean, that gold rush was interesting in the sense that it was a lot of these settlers that just moved out to California to strike it rich. But it sounds like what happens here is quite a bit different, um, particularly because you have the conflict between the Boers and, and, and the British, but also a much larger kind of imperial state, maybe, if you could speak a bit more about how mining looked different in this context than say the standard, you know, gold rush pioneers and they, you know, common man goes out to strike it rich. Yeah, thanks for that question. So um, if you want to imagine the California gold rush for a moment, um, imagine that almost anybody who can get across the United States and uh, has enough money for a mule and uh, a pickaxe and a, a pan, um, can what wade into a stream and begin prospecting uh, for gold. Um, and in fact, when we look at um, the California gold rush or the Yukon rush that follows, these are tiny proprietors who um, are able to flourish by staking out very small claims that can be worked by um, one person or one to five people, at least in the early stages. In Southern Africa, it's a very, very different uh, situation. Uh, although there are some um, fortune seekers uh, early on, it quickly becomes apparent that most of this gold is deep, deep, deep under the ground. Um, and once it becomes obvious that a very primitive sort of surface mining, um, a kind of precursor to strip mining, isn't really going to work, 
it requires enormous capitalization to dig shafts that go um, tens of thousands of uh, meters, kilometers really, uh, under the ground. It's well beyond the reach of, um, of an individual. There's another problem uh, as well. Although, as I've said, the gold reserves under the ground were extensive, the ore was very, very poor quality. And it, all, it very often was alloyed with uh, other impurities and other minerals. So once you got the gold up to the surface, you then had to smelt the gold to separate uh, the gold itself from um, the other alloy, the other uh, minerals and metals that it was uh, amalgamated with. And this also required a significant amount of money. So um, by the turn of the 19th century, um, two important things happen. Uh, one is the British fight a war uh, with the Boers, um, sometimes called the South African War, sometimes called the Boer War. And um, the real purpose of this conflict uh, was to secure untrammeled British access and control over uh, the mineral resources at the southern tip of the continent. But the other thing that it did is it opened the way for British capital uh, to move into southern Africa, where heretofore it had very little interest. And probably the most well-known landlord uh, who moved uh, into the area was uh, Cecil Rhodes. The Rhodes Scholarship is named uh, after him. And it was Rhodes who, um, along with a few other um, entrepreneurs, but highly, highly capitalized uh, businessmen, uh, move into uh, South Africa, develop what becomes Johannesburg, uh, and set up a, a remarkable uh, uh, capital-intensive mining complex in uh, the ring of uh, natural rock that surrounded the city. All right. Um... So it seems then that the discovery of, uh, of, the, of gold and diamonds and raw materials is, as you said, starts plugging South Africa into a much, or at least more intensely plugs into this capitalist economy or global capitalist economy, as opposed to just this stopping off point for more important colonies on the other side of uh, the Indian Ocean, perhaps. And now with, with this mining, because what's interesting is how you mentioned how it is very different than the California case, right? And it does create conflict amongst the British and, and the, uh, the Dutch Boers, um, largely because there's lots of money to be made. People like Cecil Rhodes move in. Uh, but what is the labor system that then emerges? If, if it's not pioneers, as you put it, sifting for gold um, uh, in the streams and, you know, this kind of mythical land of plenty in California, if it does require all this kind of capital intensive investments from say the Imperial Center in London, and these mines are really, really deep, what kind of labor system then emerges um, under that uh, type of mining operation? Well, again, Will, thanks for that question, because I think the answer to it gets right to the heart uh, of why the South African case is so important for our understanding of alternative paths to capitalism. I think it really is uh, all contained within what we might call the labor question or the labor problem uh, in Southern Africa. Because the gold is so hard to get at, um, because it's so difficult and costly to um, refine, the difference between operating this mining complex, the RAND, profitably and being unable to turn a profit and accumulate additional capital all comes down to cheap labor. Now, South Africa um, at the time of Union in 1910, uh, well after the Boer War, uh, all of those colonies are combined to create the Union of South Africa. At that time, um, the vast majority of the population, well over 90% of the entire population, are Africans. The white population is divided between uh, those who speak English and can trace their heritage to the British Isles. They clearly have the upper hand um, after the Boer War, and the Afrikaans-speaking Boers, the descendants uh, of the Dutch. And it is those Africans who are brought into uh, a capitalist economy and provide the cheap labor uh, that allows fortunes to be made, massive amounts of capital to accumulate and then flow to other parts of the empire, including other parts of British uh, Africa. And um, 
it's the British imperial state that intervenes in, in many ways, in unprecedented fashion uh, to fashion a political economy in South Africa that both provides cheap labor, institutes segregation, and puts the country on the road to, to apartheid. What I think I wanted to center on now is you mentioned toward the end of it how these mining operations bring in the 90%, over 90% of the population that are, of course, indigenous Africans. Um, they, you said they kind of bring them into the capitalist economy. And my understanding in, in the South African case that was the indigenous peoples were essentially attached to the land um, in ways that say the labor system in the American South slaves weren't because they, that system was broken through their uh, bondage to their master. But in this particular case, there is this sense that they are attached to the land. So what is it, how is it that the British lure them into this capitalist economy, whether through incentivization or outright coercion. I think you make an excellent point uh, about the attachment of most Africans uh, to the land. In fact, I think it's fair to say that well into the 20th century, um, Africans persist uh, with connection to the land. And some scholars have even talked about the endurance of an African uh, mode of, of production. What this means is British capital, or in this case, uh, the imperial state, needs to develop a number of coercive mechanisms that compel uh, certain Africans, in this case, um, young men, uh, late teenagers, men in their you know, 20s, off the land and into, into mining and into a waged economy. And the first important step in this direction comes shortly after Union, uh, which was in 1910. Uh, in 1913, there's the passage of a Natives Lands Act. And the Land Act really dispossesses um, many Africans um, from traditional lands and concentrated them in a form of territorial segregation into um, of small minority um, of, of the land in South Africa. And if we could go to uh, the map that we have, this is very, uh, I think, clearly and dramatically illustrated because what you see in black here are the um, official lands reserved uh, for Africans. And what you see um, in white uh, is uh, the vast majority of land in South Africa. Now, not all of it is arable, um, but the important point is that um, most land, including areas where um, commercial agriculture had begun to develop, and certainly including those areas where uh, minerals were being extracted, um, are now reserved uh, for whites. So the 1913 Native Lands Act is then coupled with a number of other interventions on the part of the British imperial state that moved to create a system of long distance labor migration. And the most important aspect um, of this system is something called the hut tax. And the hut tax is a tax on every single dwelling in an African village or community. And in order to raise the money to pay this hut tax, communities, and in reality, the, the chiefs, uh, and the power of African chiefdoms is, is shored up by the imperial state, they uh, send young men out uh, to work um, for a period of time on the Rand, uh, in gold mines, in Kimberley, and the diamond mines. And when those young men return seasonally uh, to their homestead, uh, the term in Afrikaans is kraal, uh, when they return to the homestead, some of their wages then are handed over so the hut tax uh, can be paid. There are other aspects that are uh, coercive as well. Um, one of the more important ones um, is pass laws. Um, Africans are not allowed to move to Johannesburg or move to Pretoria or move to Cape Town. They're meant to stay in these uh, areas that have been set aside for them. And if they're to be on the roads or to be on the trains, um, they need to have passes. Um, and the British state uh, enforces this. So there is an element um, where 
police force uh, is used to enforce uh, pass laws. That was, that was really interesting, just looking at the ways that this labor system evolves um, and how, um, what I find really fascinating about it when we look at these alternative roads to capitalism is how the primary source of labor kind of has a dual quality to it. And it reminded me of the, uh, the American South, that of course we just talked about um, uh, prior to this video, in the sense that sharecroppers kind of had one foot in the market where they were producing, say, tobacco for, you know, it's like staple crop production, just like the plantation economy had been doing for a long time. But at the same time, when it came to their own personal consumption, we're largely living a subsistence lifestyle. Um, do we see similarities in South Africa? And could you also talk about the kind of theoretical implications of that um, in terms of our course and how different places end up um, in a capitalist mode of production? I think the comparison with um, the American South after the Civil War is an, is an excellent one. And in fact, there, there is a quite sustained scholarly literature on this. Um, the notion of a dual economy is really important here, and it characterizes uh, both the American South and South Africa in the period we're, we're now looking at. As you've pointed out, in large parts of the tobacco South, the cotton South, um, sharecroppers clearly are producing a staple that's sold uh, on the world market, mm -hmm. whether it be tobacco or cotton or indigo or what, what have you. Yet if we look at the actual existence, day-to-day -day existence, the social relations uh, of sharecropping, um, they're not a part of a market economy. Um, many of these families could go years without seeing money, without seeing wages. Um, the way they were supplied with the necessities of life um, it was very different than purchasing those things uh, in, in, in an open market. Well, in South Africa, we also see a dual economy. Um, let's use the example that um, we've just been talking about uh, of long distance labor migration to the gold mines of the Rand. Uh, for seven or eight months, um, a young man is in really at the center of a capitalist economy, um, providing gold uh, for the world's most uh, dynamic and dominant uh, imperial power, uh, Britain. Um, but when that young man goes back home, um, he enters a very, very different uh, economy, one where uh, his family still has attachment to the land and is growing foodstuffs for sustenance. Um, and in a theoretical sense, I think there are two points to be made. These two spheres, whether we're looking at the US South or looking at South Africa, they're not existing independently or in an autonomous way from each other, far from it. They're actually mutually constitutive. They support each other. And we can call this the articulation of two different modes of production. Let me explain what I mean a little more fully by looking at the South African case. One of the reasons that cheap labor is so cheap has little to do with the notion of debased wages that are being paid Africans. Rather, it has everything to do with the fact that the cost of the reproduction of labor, the social reproduction of labor, is not taking place on the mines, it's not taking place outside of um, those homesteads, but rather it's being borne by those communities, largely by women in those communities, because with so many men away, it's the women who are tending the fields. It's the women who are raising the children. It's the women who are preparing for the return of their menfolk who are migrant laborers. The cost of the reproduction of labor is born by this other section of the economy. And that's what allows extractive industry to continue to function so profitably because it's helping drive down uh, the cost of labor. Well, interesting. And that interestingly brings up, I think, a uh, point I made in the last lecture, which is, I think, that Rosa Luxemburg point where in certain modes, in often capitalism relies on a non-capitalist form of production. And I guess this is a perfect example that illustrates you have this dynamic capitalist world economy, 
that is dependent on this, as you said, one of the most important gold reserves in the world at the time. And yet so much of the cost of reproducing that labor exists in a non-capitalist mode of production. And so that they're kind of dependent on creating that dual thing. Last question I had was, um, if, if you could speak to this, when we talked about the, the Southern road to capitalism, and, and it was in the readings where Jonathan Weiner talks about the, this Prussian road, right? This theoretical Prussian road. If the South takes a Prussian road to capitalism, in the case of South Africa, could you characterize it as a kind of imperial road to capitalism? Or is that oversimplifying it? I think it simplifies it, but it simplifies it in a way that makes a very powerful point. The key actor here is the British imperial state. Um, there's no getting around that. And we began our uh, discussion by pointing out that this sets South Africa on a road or a path that takes them to segregation and then ultimately to apartheid. And you know, when scholars first began looking and trying to understand uh, this very harsh system of race relations that characterized mid and late 20th century South Africa, they assumed that um, this all came from the Dutch. Um, it really was a legacy of um, the Dutch East India Company and a legacy of the relations between uh, Boers and, uh, and natives. Scholarship really has moved well away from that and has come to a consensus that it really is the British imperial state and its need to mobilize and to manage cheap labor um, that leads to segregation and then uh, lays the groundwork for apartheid, um, even though uh, apartheid is a system that's presided over by um, uh, an Afrikaans uh, political project, the National Party that uh, comes to power in the late 1940s.